Romans chapter 9. This is, I'm going to say, the climax or the beginning of the section, which is the climax of the Apostles' argument in the book of Romans. The righteousness of God with Israel. And you know, it's at once both a most fascinating and a most controversial section of the book. Fascinating, of course, because it deals with the subject of election. The method by which God would choose one person and reject another person from salvation. Romans, of course, this this particular chapter in particular, raises some of the most difficult questions in Scripture and answers them. So if if I had to choose a chapter of Romans which would be my favourite, there's no question, it would be Romans chapter 9. You wait till you see the argument unfold. So it's fascinating. It's controversial because to many modern commentators... Chapters 9, 10, and 11 are a closed book. They can't make sense of it. In fact, one commentator I own said it like this. The book of Romans is eight chapters of gospel at the beginning, five chapters of application at the end, and three chapters of puzzle in the middle, referring to these three chapters, 9, 10, and 11. That's the section we're going to commence. And the fact is, you know, even the truth... We may regard Romans 9 through 11 as something like a standalone section in the middle of Romans all about God's dealing with the nation of Israel. And now the reason people might think Romans breaks up a little like that is because the fact is you could read directly from chapter 8 verse 39, the last verse in chapter 8, straight into chapter 12 verse 1 without any disruption in the flow of argument. You could conclude the story of the argument of Romans in Romans chapter 8. And the fact is, I've got a set of notes on my shelf at home, which is just Romans 1 to 8. I've heard series of studies which brethren have done, Romans 1 to 8. There's no question Romans 8 is the end of a subsection in Romans. So chapter 8 verse 39 is a pause, if you like, in the argument. But let me put it like this. If, if you were to think of Romans as, as an argument just revolving around chapters 1 to 8, it would be a bit like eating the cake without the icing. This, this, there's no question this is the climax of the argument that rolls through chapters 1 to 8. It, it, let me just draw your attention to some of the links. In chapter 8, verse 33... You have the subject of election. Who will lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Well, you meet exactly the same word in chapter 9, verse 11. The purpose of God according to election. Romans 8, verse 15. You have the subject of adoption. We've received the spirit of adoption, he says. Well, chapter 9, verse 4. Amongst the eight blessings bestowed upon Israel was, first, the adoption. Chapter 8, verse 16, speaks about the fact that we are children of God. Chapter 9, verse 8, speaks of children of God. You see, he's actually continuing the argument of chapters 1 to 8, not starting a completely new and unrelated argument about the nation of Israel. But before we begin, or before the apostle begins to expound this section, there's a problem. You see, up until this point of time, Paul has been arguing the case for the righteousness of God using the doctrine of the atonement and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in relation to that. And at almost every turn in the road, he's run up against this or that Jewish Jewish notion, which was contrary to scripture. The purpose of the law, the place of Abraham, the significance of Christ... The right of baptism, the Jews had very strong thoughts on all of those sorts of things, which were most often wrong. So you see that by the end of chapter 8, what you've got to, as far as the apostles are concerned, is that there's a good portion of the Roman ecclesia, or ecclesias, who would at this point have a very dim view of the apostle. I mean the Jewish portion of, portion of the ecclesias, a very dim view At best, they might have said that he was nullifying Old Testament scripture. At worst, they might have said that he'd become completely anti-Semitic. You think about the argument so far as it is in Romans. Chapter 1, the Gentiles have failed 
to find God. They are completely unrighteous. Well, of course, the Jew would have applauded that conclusion at the end of chapter 1. But then look what happens. Chapter 2. God's no respecter of persons, he says, even though the Jew thought he was. Circumcision is no guarantee of God's favour, even though the Jew thought, he, thought it was. Men are accounted Jews based on their character, not based on their physical descent. Based on that, you see, the Jews in the Ecclesia could well argue that Paul was saying that there's really no such thing as a Jew. Couldn't he? Chapter 3, oh, well, says a Jew, I've got the law. I'll be fine, I've got the law of Moses. Not good enough, says Paul. The law was never, ever intended to save you. Righteousness comes by faith. It does not come by the law. Chapter 4, look at Abraham. He was pronounced righteous before even the law was given. And then look at David, as chapter 4 says. He couldn't have saved himself by works even if he'd wanted to. There was no law that could absolve him of the sins he'd committed, adultery, murder. And therefore he concludes at the end of chapter 4 that Abraham is not just the father of the Jews, but also of the non-Jews. And then chapter 5, what does that say? Well, it says that all men are born under condemnation from Adam. The Jew didn't agree with that. He thought he was above condemnation. The problem is, Paul says in Romans 5 verse 12, that sin came by one man. And the Jews are also descendants of Adam. They're also descendants of that one man, just like Gentiles are. Baptism, chapter 6, applies to everyone. The Jew thought that baptism was a rite that applied to Gentiles who had to wash themselves before they could become Jews. What's more, chapter 7 says, that law, that the law as mere law did nothing for you. It was only a tool to lead you to Christ. And because of all of that, you see, by the time you get to chapter 8, the world is not divided between Jew and Gentile. It's divided between carnal and spiritual. He's completely redefined the two groups of people that make up the entire population of humanity to what the Jew thought. The Jew divided between the world between Jew and Gentile. The apostles divided them between carnal and spiritual. He has completely obscured the identity of the Jew in his argument. And you can imagine the Jewish mind running down those chapters, you see. By the time he gets to the end of chapter 8, he's been completely demolished, hasn't he? Everything he stood for has been wiped out. Completely wiped out. So the question arises now in chapter 9. If that's the case, is Israel finished? Is Israel finished? You see that? So entirely has the apostle dismantled the Jewish notions of legalistic righteousness, that by the time you get to chapter 9, he's reeling in despair, wondering whether God still has a purpose with the nation of Israel. Well, this is what chapter 9, 10, and 11 look like. I'm just going to restrict my comments on this slide, at least, to chapter 9. The simple answer is this. Yes, God still does have a purpose with the nation of Israel. Chapter 9, verses 1 to 5, open the chapter with words of genuine distress that the apostle has over the nation. Now, he says these words, he begins like this to allay any concerns that he was anti-Jewish. The fact is that the real argument of chapter 9 begins in verse 6. But he prefixes it, you see, by these heartfelt sentiments of his feeling for the nation, given the blessings they had and the atrocious mess they've made of them. Well, verses 6 to 13, as I say, the argument begins... Just because some Jews never believed, he says, does not mean that God's purpose with the nation is finished. Jewish disobedience could never undermine God's purpose. Why not? And this is earth-shattering. Because God never, ever intended to save the whole nation anyway. He never intended to save every Jew. Only the true seed of Abraham. That's the process of election. But, verses 14 to 18, does that mean God's unjust? If he picks one person and he discards another person, 
Does that mean he's unjust? No, says the apostle, it's not a matter of God's justice, it's a matter of God's mercy. No one deserves salvation. No, no one has the right to be picked by God. And so verses 19 to 21, he deals with, he, he explains that by reference to God dealing with people like a potter does with the clay. And the simple summary of that section is, and it's a bit of a complicated and controversial section, God does not reject any item, or if you like, any person, until that, beca- that person becomes unworkable. And since salvation is subject to God's mercy, rather than man's nationality, Gentiles can be saved equally well as Jews. And then before, between verses 22 and 29, he quotes four Old Testament passages to prove his point. He quotes the prophecy of Hosea twice to show that not all Gentiles would be lost. And he quotes the prophecy of Isaiah twice to show that not all Jews would be saved. And then he concludes the chapter, verses 30 to 33, with an explanation of where the Jews went wrong. So that's the story of chapter 9. But as you can see, we're entering a highly sensitive section of the book of Romans. This is the story of God's treatment with the nation of Israel, and the Jews not going to agree with this exposition unless the apostle can prove it unequivocally. When I say unequivocally, I don't mean prove it by logic. I mean prove it by scripture. These are Jews. You're going to say anything, particularly about their nation, you're going to have to prove it by scripture. Everything he says is going to have to be beyond question, underlined twice. How does he do that? This is how he does it. 33 times in three chapters, Romans 9, 10, and 11, the Old Testament is quoted. In fact, in Romans 9 alone, there are 13 quotations from the Old Testament, which I've got to tell you is more than in any other chapter of the Bible. 13 times he's going to quote the Old Testament in this chapter, to make his point. Nothing, nothing else in scripture compares with this, you see, but you'll appreciate, for half the ecclesia, who was the initial audience of this letter, there is no subject in the world more controversial. That's what I mean. This is Romans chapter 9. Unbelievable. Well, he begins the chapter. Chapter 9, verses 1 to 5, Paul's distress at Israel's unbelief. Verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, he says, I lie not, my conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And why does he need to say that? Why does he need to begin the chapter like that? Well, because, as we explained a moment ago, he has a certain reputation. There were many who regarded him a traitor to the nation. I mean, they've just read eight chapters, and by chapter 9, verse 1, they'd regard him as a, tra- as a traitor to the Jewish cause. Well, let me just show you something about the apostle's reputation. You know, in Acts chapter 21, after the conclusion of the third missionary journey, the apostle comes back to the Jerusalem ecclesia, and the arranging brethren of that ecclesia took him aside in Acts 21:21. Or oh, Acts 29, sorry, 21 verse 18, uh, they took him aside and they spoke privately to him, and this is what they said. It says in verse 18 of Acts 21, the day following, Paul went in with us, that is, with Luke and those who'd gathered, unto James, the recording brother of the Jerusalem ecclesia, largest ecclesia in the world, Jewish ecclesia. And all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And they said to him, Paul, thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they're all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. That's the reputation he's got, you see. Not just in Rome. This is back in Jerusalem. He's got this reputation amongst the Jewish world 
within Christadelphia in the first century. That's why he begins chapter 9 in the way he does. The result of this, by the way, in Acts 21, the result of this discussion was that the apostle goes to the temple. He goes to the temple on the seventh day, the record tells us. And the Jews in the temple, non-Christadelphians, they start a riot. He's arrested, he appeals to Caesar, and he ends up in prison in Rome. It's this discussion which led to his ultimate imprisonment in Rome the first time. That's how sensitive things were, you see, and that's why, as I say, he opens the chapter in the way he does. He's very keenly aware of it. And so you read three times in verse 1 of Romans chapter 9, statements of his integrity. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying, he says. The Holy Spirit confirms my honesty, which, by the way, is simply a means of saying that I'm telling you the truth before God. Back in Acts chapter 5 and verse 3, you might recall that Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, which a couple of verses later is said to, be, is said to mean that they lied to God. So he says, my conscience, as it were, I could, if I could paraphrase, my conscience bearing me witness before God. Three times in verse 1, he's determined about the genuineness of his spirit. Such was the agony of mind, in fact, that he had on this issue that he wishes as though he could swap places with the nation. Look at verse 3. I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now you might instantly recognize in that verse the sentiments of Moses in Exodus 32.32. 32. After the incident of the golden calf, he, on the sixth occasion, ascends the mountain uninvited, and he gets to the top and he says to God, if thou wilt, forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book thou hast written. What's he saying? If you're going to destroy them, then destroy me with them, isn't he? If Israel, if Israel must die, I'll die with them. Do you see in verse 3 the apostles going one step further? If I could die, he says, I wouldn't die with them. I'd die for them, isn't he? I'd die for them. And you know, look, read carefully verse 3. He knows what he's saying is an impossibility. He says, he doesn't say I wish, he says I could wish. I could wish. Now, what, what he's, what he's, the offer he's making in verse 3 is not a realistic offer, but it is a measure of his sincerity. He says, I could wish that I myself was accursed. The word accursed there is the Greek word anathema. It means devoted to destruction as an accursed thing. Uh, you, you read it many times in the Old Testament. Achan took the accursed thing, those Babylonish garments and wedge of gold and such, the things from Jericho, he took them, he becomes, as a consequence, an accursed thing himself, devoted to destruction. What he's saying here in verse 3 is, if it were possible, I'd forfeit the kingdom of God to save my nation. If I could, he says. And, and the unbelief, you see, the unbelief of the nation of Israel was all the more tragic by virtue of the privileges they had. Look at verses 4 and 5. There are eight privileges enumerated here which the nation of Israel was subject to. Who are Israelites, this nation he says, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth, number one, the adoption, two, the glory, three, the covenant, four, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all God-blessed forever. It's not saying, by the way, that Christ is God. In my margin, I've made a little change. God-blessed. Christ is blessed by God forever. But what are these blessings? Eight blessings, you see, that came upon the nation of Israel. What were they? The adoption. Well, as the slide says... That's sonship. As a nation, they became God's children. The glory. They got the glory. That is, the Shekinah glory 
that dwelt in the most holy place and proved that God dwelt amongst them. They got the covenants. Now there's debate, in fact, in translations whether it's covenant singular or covenant plural here. If it's covenant singular, it would evidently be the Mosaic covenant. If it's covenants plural, then you could add to that the Abrahamic and the Davidic. They got the law given at Sinai, the basis of the nation and the envy of all surrounding nations. Uh, the people who looked at them were meant to look upon them and their conduct and their wisdom and say, what nation is there so mighty as this that has your God? They had the service of God, it says, towards the end of verse 4. What's that? It, it, it's actually the service of the tabernacle with the priests and the priesthood who could atone for the sins of the nation. What of the nation had that? They had the promises. These are not the covenant promises. These are now the, the, the multitude of promises that the prophets delivered throughout the Old Testament. The guarantee, if you like, of God's providence working in their lives. So, for example, Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, the promise of a coming Messiah modelled after Moses himself. Who would be a king, Jeremiah 23, verse 5, after the nation was restored and elevated? So, I mean, countless promises you could enumerate. Whose were the fathers? They had the fathers, and you might say, well, what's so special about that? We've all got fathers. No, 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 no. It was because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were the fathers of this nation that all the blessings came upon them. God didn't choose them in Deuteronomy chapter 7 because they were greatest or the most numerous of all nations. He chose them because of a relationship he had with Abraham. The fathers were worth an awful lot to that nation. And then, if you like, the greatest blessing of all, the Messiah, came from Israel. And as a consequence of him being a Jew... He went first to the house of Israel. Enormous number of blessings. But despite those blessings, perhaps in spite of those blessings, the nation, at least as a nation, completely failed to respond. And so now the apostle drops a bombshell in verse 6. The nation's unbelief does not disrupt God's purpose. Verse 6 through verse 13. Does the fact that the nation didn't believe or didn't respond to God's work with them, does that mean that God's purpose with the nation has failed? Does it mean that the prophecies about the nation have failed? And the answer, of course, is no. Why no? Why? Why? And the answer was because God's purpose with the nation of Israel never required the salvation of every Jew. And, and as you'll see, he never even intended, right from the days of Abraham, to save every mortal descendant of Abraham. Now, that, I say that's a bombshell. The Jews never, ever thought that. That never entered their mind. They thought they were automatically saved as a consequence of having Abraham's blood. God's intention from the outset was never to save every single Jew. Look at the argument, verse 6. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. So what's the verse saying? Does Israel's belief make God's purpose with them of none effect? No, they're not all Israel which are of Israel. What does that mean? It means that the hope of salvation was only ever to a special class within the nation. It was never intended to include every Jew. So, so think about what that means to a Jew reading this epistle. Never intended to include everyone. They're not all Israel after the spirit, he says, which are of Israel after the flesh. That's the point. Verse 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, there wouldn't be a Jew alive that didn't agree with that. They thought, you see, they thought they were saved simply because they were Abraham's seed, by natural descent. The problem was Abraham had two children. Was Ishmael saved? Were both of Abraham's children saved? No, they weren't, were they? They weren't. Ah, but the Jews got an answer for that. He says, well, of course not. 
because they had different mothers. So of course only Isaac would be saved. Descent had to be through Isaac. Sure. Well then were all Isaac's children saved? Verse 10. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, having done neither any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. So Isaac had two children, but Esau wasn't selected. So it's not good enough simply to be a son of Isaac. Yet, Esau was a son of Isaac by the same mother as Jacob. Not only that, he was a twin of Jacob. And not just a twin, the firstborn twin. And if that's not enough, brothers and sisters, the decision that God made on Esau's eternal welfare was made before the kid was even born. As as the point is made clearly in verse 11, he hadn't even done good or evil and God's already decided against him. Unbelievable. At least, you might say, at least Ishmael's character was made manifest when he was rejected from the household of Abraham. Esau hadn't even seen the light of day. And God selected against him. But in the foreknowledge of God, His character was evident. God knew what the boy would be like. Verse 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And he knew that when the boys were in the womb fighting each other. Now verse 11 calls that the purpose of God according to election. The word election means selection. It just means selection. That is the decision God makes with people in order to fulfill his purpose. And that purpose required the selection of Jacob and the rejection of Esau, even before the boy had shown his true colours. How would you be if in this hall we had a mother right now who we knew was going to give birth to twins? Well, there wouldn't be, a, wouldn't be one of us who would say one's in the kingdom and the other one's not. By name. But that's what happens here. So, so what are this, this section, what's this section saying? Here's the summary. A man does not commend himself to God simply by being born of Abraham because Ishmael was not commended. A nation does not commend itself to God simply by being born of Isaac because, because Esau was not commended. And I say nation because in verse 13... When Malachi says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, he's speaking about two nations. He's speaking about Jews and Edomites because two nations are in thy womb, Rebecca was told in Genesis 25. So a nation doesn't commend itself to God simply by being born of Isaac because Esau wasn't commended. You see, the Jews thought that God was obliged to accept them just because they were children of Abraham, but Paul has just shown on two occasions that did not occur. And why? Why not? Well, because simply having Abraham's blood is not how God defines being a child of Abraham. The question is, do you live like Abraham? Do you obey God's word? That was what the real question is here. That's the rub. Abraham's natural blood is of about as much use for your salvation as Christ's literal blood. The question is, what are you like? But can you see where this is heading? The very principle that the apostle has just established, which would allow God to choose Isaac over Ishmael, or Jacob over Esau, will also allow him to choose Gentile over Jew. Because what if the Gentile had more the character of Abraham than the Jew? I mean, what was the reason God chose Isaac over Ishmael, or Jacob over Esau? It was about their characters. Well, where would the Jews stand then, based on the fact that this is how God acts, where would the Jews stand if the Gentile had a character that he didn't? You see, he's setting himself up, and, well, I'll tell you now, in verse 24, that is exactly the conclusion he gets to. But he's setting himself up for this argument. But before you get to verse 24, 
you've now, you've now begun a lot of other side questions. Because when it came to Ishmael or Esau, the Jews didn't care. They were perfectly happy to write those boys off and the nations that came from them. They didn't care at all. They didn't give a rush about those two descendants of Abraham. But the moment you turn around and say that God might save a Gentile and reject the Jew, oh, that's not fair. Not fair. Verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? By no means, he says. Now, how can the apostle simply say, is God unrighteous? Definitely not. How can he say that? Well, the quote for your margin would be something like Psalm 92, verse 15. There is no unrighteousness with God. Like it's an explicit statement in Psalm 92, verse 15. There is no unrighteousness with God. So, God forbid, or let it not be, by no means, is true. That is to say, God always makes the correct choice. He is going to get it right. However, in order to answer the question in verse 14 more fully, is God arbitrary about who he selects? Does he play fair? Does he give everyone a fair crack? Moses, uh, sorry, Paul is going to bring into view two characters. Moses and Pharaoh. He's going to introduce us to these two men. Moses and Pharaoh. And I'll tell you why. Moses pleads with God to save Israel. Back in Exodus, he, but when I say plead, uh, to save Israel, he pleads with God to save every single Jew. And God says no. Pharaoh, on the other hand, conspires against God to destroy Israel, by which I mean every single Jew. And God says, no. Now, why is that important? And it's simple. The answer is because God never intended to save every single Jew, therefore Moses was wrong. But God did say he would save the nation, which required the salvation of at least some Jews, and therefore Pharaoh was wrong. You see? And here's the argument. Verse 15. For God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. Now, that is a quotation from Exodus 33, verse 19, after the incident of the golden calf. Now, what happened? Just cast your mind back. Well, God told Moses. I mean, Moses comes down the mountain, he smashes the tables of stone, and God tells Moses to stand aside while he destroyed the nation and began again with Moses. And Moses intercedes, as we mentioned a little earlier, with to God, for the nation. If they're going to die, he says, then let me die with them. Blot my name out. God says, no, not acceptable. Not acceptable. Moses says then, well, all right then, will you save them for me? Based upon the fact that we've got a first name relationship, will you do it for me? If you, don't, if you won't do it in an outright sense for them, will you do it for me? God says, you know what, Moses, I will do it for you. I'll save them for you. And so then Moses says, all right, whew, I've got one more request. Show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. Let me see the character of the God that would destroy a nation. Let me see the character of the God that I'm dealing with. And the answer comes back and he says, all right, I'll do that for you, Moses. I'll make all my goodness pass before thee. I'll be gracious to whom I'm gracious. And I'll show mercy to whom I'll show mercy. You see, what, God, uh, sorry, what Moses didn't appreciate was that in order that God might save the nation, it did not obligate him to save every single Jew in the wilderness. <laughs> Within a year, let me tell you, the whole wilderness generation had been consigned to death. By Numbers chapter 14, your carcasses shall perish in the wilderness. You see, God was right God was right in his initial judgment against the nation. But his purpose was going to continue through the next generation. The nation would still survive, though not every individual would be involved. And so verse 16. So then he says, It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now what does that mean? Well, the him that wills and the him that runs is Moses. You see? Moses. 
In simple terms, what he's saying is that, is that the fulfillment of God's plan is not up to Moses. In Exodus 31 verse 12, Moses willed when he asked God to forgive Israel. That was Moses' will. In Exodus 34 verse 8, Moses it said, it says, made haste and prayed for God's angel to go with them. So Moses willed and Moses ran to try and save every single Jew. What he didn't understand was that God didn't need to save every single Jew to fulfill his purpose with Israel. But in the same way as God would show mercy to whom he had shown mercy, he would also show judgment to whom he would show judgment. Verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, that my name might be, might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, he hath mercy on whom he'll have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. Now, what's going on there? Well, it's very simple. God shows mercy to some and deliberately doesn't show it to others. As we know in the case of Pharaoh, God specifically hardened him and then destroyed him. Which only raises the next question. Verse 19. Well, he says, Thou wilt say then unto me, says the apostle. So he's speaking to the ecclesia. He says, And since I've said this, and I've told you how God acts, you're going to say to me, Well then, why does God find fault with Pharaoh? Because Pharaoh did not resist his will. How can God take a man and harden him, which means he is going to sin, and then punish him for sinning? How can God do that in verse 19? How can God punish Pharaoh for resisting his will when God hardened his heart in the first place and no one can resist God? Did Pharaoh have a choice? Now this, of course, in verse 19, is one of those passages which has generated an enormous amount of discussion. You'll be aware that many times in the Exodus record throughout the, the ten plagues, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. You perhaps will be equally aware that on many other occasions it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And we might explain that by saying that these, these two statements complement rather than contradicting each other. Well, well that's true, but how is it true? And, and does that really answer verse 19? Well, no, it doesn't. Let me tell you that the answer to this riddle is to be found in how the potter works with the clay. Now, I'm going to come back to Pharaoh and show you what I mean in a moment, but let's just keep, let's just keep reading for a, a bit. Verses 20 and 21. Look what he says. But nay, oh, uh, sorry, nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Now, that's Paul's answer to the question of verse 19. Do you think that answers the question? Why does God find fault with people who hardens, who, who resist his will, and then God punishes? Well, verse 20, who art thou that replies against God? Verse 21, shall the thing that God formed question why it's been formed in such a way? Now, commentators have looked at what Paul says in verse 19 and looked at the answer he gives in verses 20 and 21, and concluded often that Paul sidesteps the issue. That his answer is simply, who are you, O oh man, to answer God back? And I must admit, when I first read this, when I was much younger, I thought, what, what, what kind of an answer is that? One commentator I read said, this is the weakest point of the entire epistle. Well, if you had a superficial understanding of these verses, sure, it's the weakest point of the epistle. Let me show you what's actually happening here. He's speaking about the potter's work with the clay. And in order to do that, he quotes a combination of, as your margin says, Isaiah 29, Isaiah 64, Isaiah 45. But there's another very powerful, and I'm going to suggest most important quotation in your margin, and you need to highlight it. It's Jeremiah 18 and verse 6. You'll see it there by the little F on verse 21. This is the critical quote to understand the solution to this dilemma. What does it say in Jeremiah 18? Here's Jeremiah 18, verse 6 to 10 on the screen. O house of Israel, he says, cannot I do with you as with this potter, sorry, as this potter, saith Yahweh? Behold, 
As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. So there's your context. There's no question. We're talking about how the potter works with the clay. At what instant, the potter says, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I pronounced turn from their evil, then I will repent of the evil that I thought to do to them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it then go and do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will also repent of the good wherewith I said I'd benefit them. Now there are two points to observe from Jeremiah 18. Here's the first one. It's God's prerogative as the potter to make whatever he wants. And the second point is that the exercise of God's will is conditioned by the response of the clay. Do you see the significance of that? It's God's prerogative as a potter to make whatever he wants, but the exercise of God's will toward that clay is conditioned by the response of the clay. What does that mean in plain English? It means this. God will work with the pot until such time as the pot becomes unworkable. At that point, God will use that pot for his purposes without any consideration for the eternal well-being of the pot because he's given up with the pot. But, until, but if that pot continues to be workable, the, the potter will take it off the wheel, squish it together, and try and reform it into the pot he wants. If it's marred, he'll pull out that little stone and keep working with the pot. The minute the pot says, get your hands off me, throw the pot away. Or else he'll leave the pot and make it an object example for other pots not to copy. But the critical thing is, he never stops working with the pot until the pot becomes unworkable. Now let's talk about Pharaoh. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardens his own heart. Let me show you how it happens. God only, as it turns out, hardens Pharaoh's heart after Pharaoh has proven himself unworkable. Look at the ten plagues. We've got a, we've got a prophecy in uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 21, and Exodus 7, verse 3, before the plagues begin, that God will harden Pharaoh's heart. And then we have the plague of blood. Pharaoh hardens his heart. Frogs, he hardens his heart. Lice, he hardens his heart. Flies, he hardens his heart. Murrain, he hardens his heart. Only when it comes to the boils... Does God say, I'm going to harden his heart? Hail comes, he hardens his heart. And then from, then from that point on, God hardens. God hardens. God hardens. Do you see the point? God did not harden Pharaoh's heart until Pharaoh became unworkable. And I draw your attention to Exodus 7, verses 13 and 14. It would appear to say in the authorised version that God hardened Pharaoh's heart right at the beginning in Exodus chapter 7. Uh, all modern translations disagree. So I'm quoting you here the RSV, but the NIV is the same. Pharaoh hardens his own heart in Exodus 7, verses 13 and 14. Uh, so what you find, you see, is by the time God hardens Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh has already hardened it himself seven times. God does not stop working with the pot, even if it's an Egyptian pot, until the pot becomes unworkable. That's the fundamental policy of the potter and the clay. In fact, in Exodus 9 and verse 16, it says that Pharaoh was specifically told by Moses, for this cause, he says, I have raised thee up to show my power in thee, speaking on behalf of God. The result was, at the end of Exodus chapter 9, Pharaoh sinned yet more, it says. So you see the point? The clay always determines its own destiny. God doesn't give up on a person until there's no chance left. But there's one thing God does do. When a person has proven themselves unworkable, God doesn't necessarily discard them straight away. He may well use them to save others, even if they won't be saved themselves. So, verse 22. Well, what if God 
willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. So here are people who will not be in the kingdom of God, vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And the word fitted is in the middle voice, which simply means they have fitted themselves to destruction. It's their choice to be destroyed. Now, they might not think of it quite in those terms, but by their own conduct, they bring the sentence against themselves. Verse 23, And that God make, in, might, in contrast, make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. But you notice the difference between verses 22 and 23. Obviously, verse 22 is talking about people fitted to destruction, and verse 23 is talking about people fitted to glory, or prepared for glory. Yes, yes, but the difference is this. The vessels of wrath, in verse 22, fit themselves to destruction. The vessels of mercy, in verse 23, are prepared by God. They're prepared by God. And you see, this is where it becomes meaningful for us, brothers, sisters, young people. God is equally as long-suffering with us as he was with Pharaoh. Because we're being shaped for his purpose. We're not being shaped for our purpose. So God's the potter, not us. We can therefore never stop responding to the hand of the potter. At your own peril, do you stop responding to the hand of the, pot, of the potter? So we might look at trials that come upon us. Why is this happening to me? Why is that happening to me? In fact, often I, I often think the trials that come upon me are trials that are so because I'm fighting the hand of the potter. Or, or I want to be a different kind of pot to what the potter has decided. The excitation, therefore, is simple. We've got to remain pliable. The water's got to keep going on the clay. I mean, if you stop reading your Bible, the clay dries out. We're earthen vessels. The water leaks out. And all of a sudden, well, dry clay is just not as pliable as wet clay, is it? Think about why we've been called to the truth and why our next-door neighbour wasn't called to the truth. What's so special about us? Nothing is so special about us. God simply showed mercy. He simply showed mercy. So then think about how we reward him for his mercy. And how much of our time, our energy, our motivations, our aspirations revolve around what God wants instead of what we want. And so when you come to verse 24, he now drops the next bombshell. Even us, he says, whom God hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Understanding all of that, he says, it's very clear not all Jews will be saved. But understanding all of that, he says, it's equally clear not all Gentiles will be lost. God's purpose doesn't require a, a, a firm cleaving to only one nation. He's looking for a certain character, you see. And, and what he does now between verses 25 and 29 is he gives four Old Testament quotations to prove his point. Two from Hosea and two from Isaiah. And look at them. Remarkable. Verse 25. As God also said in Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. Now that's a quotation from Hosea 2 and verse 23. What's it all about? Well, there were ten tribes that had just been sent into Assyrian captivity. They were God's people, but Hosea, Hosea says they, they, they became wicked and now they are not my people, being as they're now in captivity. But in the kingdom of God, God will have them back. He'll, he'll regather all of national Israel and they'll become my people again. You see, and that's what he's saying. I will call them my people in the kingdom age, which were not my people and her beloved, which was not beloved. So he's talking about the restoration of the nation of Israel. And then again in verse 26. It shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Now that's a quotation from Hosea 1 verse 10. It's making the same point as verse 25, but with a difference. Israel doesn't just become God's people in verse 26. They become children of the living God. 
Now that's not the name, or well, that's not the same as just being natural Israel. That's spiritual Israel. Just you turn one page back to chapter 8, verse 14. Israel and the kingdom are going to become children of the living God. Chapter 8, verse 14 says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So do you see what Hosea is saying in verse 26 of Romans 9? Israel is not just regathered. They're converted to the truth. That's how they become my people again. That's how they become children of the living God, not simply by being relocated from the four corners of the world back to the land of Israel, but by being changed in their character. But here's the question. Hosea is speaking of the Jews, and he's applying these scriptures to Gentiles, because what he's basically saying in these verses here is, that the Gentiles can come to the truth. I mean, that's what he's just said in verse 24, and this is how he's proving it. Well, there's the question for you. How can can Paul take Jewish scriptures, which are talking about the regathering of the nation, and say that those scriptures now, I'm appropriating them, I'm applying them to the Gentiles to prove to you that the Gentiles can come to the truth? The answer is this. This whole notion of my people or not my people, Where does that first occur in the Bible? And by happy coincidence, in chapter 10 and verse 19, you have a quotation from Deuteronomy uh, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 21. And this is what it says, Romans 10 verse 19, quoting Deuteronomy 32. But I say, he says, did not Israel know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are not my people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. So what he's simply saying here is that God tried to provoke Israel back to the truth by choosing the Gentiles. He tried to make Israel jealous of the hope of salvation by by calling non-Jews to the truth. It didn't work. But that's what he tried to do. But my point is, the Gentiles are called no people. That's who it is in verse 19. They're called no people or not my people. So think about what you've just read then back in chapter 9, verse 25, 26. The Jews were my people. They disobeyed. They became not my people. But in the kingdom age, you're going to bring them back, convert them, and call them my people. Ah. So what that means is if God can take a people who are not my people and bring them back to the, well, bring them back into the fold and call them my people, if he can do that with the Jews... He can do it with the Gentiles, who are not my people, and call them my people. You see that? He's just established, by quoting Jewish scriptures, the method by which God can justify calling the Gentiles to the truth. Because he simply says, God can take a people who are not my people and call them my people if they convert. Well, he's going to do that with Israel in the future, so clearly... He can do it with the Gentiles now. Let me tell you, that is a brilliant use of two quotations in Hosea. And now two quotations from Isaiah, verse 27. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. It's quoting Isaiah 10, verse 22. And it's simply saying, God only ever expected to save a remnant in Israel. He always knew that most of the Jews would be unresponsive. Verse 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Now the short work here that's being spoken of, back in this is Isaiah 10 verse 23. Isaiah 10 verse 23 says that God will make a consumption or a destruction in the midst of the land. Now, initially, of course, it had reference to the Assyrian invasion in the days of Hezekiah. But Paul is using it in verse 28 here of the imminent destruction of AD 70. And he calls it a short work because Matthew 24 and verse 22 says, except those days should be shortened, no flesh would be saved. And then verse 29. And as Isaiah said before, so here's the second quotation, 
except Yahweh of Sabaoth, or the Lord of Sabaoth, had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. Quoting Isaiah 1 verse 9, once again the emphasis is on a remnant. If God hadn't left a remnant here, he would have wiped us out in the same way he wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah. There would have been complete and utter annihilation of the Jewish race. Unless God preserved a remnant. But you see, in those four quotations, he's just established two principles, two king principles. Number one, God can take a group who are not his people and he can make them his people. That's what Hosea teaches. And it's not restricted just to Jews. And secondly, from all those that have called, God only ever expects to save a remnant. That's what Isaiah teaches. And if I could be so bold as to suggest, that also is not restricted just to Jews. So verse 25, 26, two quotes from Hosea to show that not all Gentiles would be lost. Verses 27 through 29, two quotes from Isaiah to show that not all Jews would be saved. So summarise that. Some Gentiles would be called despite the fact that the Jews thought none would be. Some Jews would be called, despite the fact that the Jews thought that all would be. And in both cases, if I had time, I could show you, it's the children of these prophets that tell the story. Because my people, in fact, is the Hebrew word emi, which was Hosea's son. And the beloved, in verse 25, is the Hebrew word ruama, which was Hosea's daughter. And the remnant of verses 27 to 29, well, that's Isaiah's son, Shea Jashub, a remnant would return. So in fact, the children, the names of the children tell the stories of these two prophets. And that brings us to the final section, verses 30 through 33. Verse 30 says, Well, what shall we say then, he says, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. How is it, he says, that the Gentiles who had none of Israel's privileges succeeded where Israel failed? Well, it's, it's easy, he says, verse 32. How? Wherefore? Well, because, the Gentile, because, sorry, because the Jews sought it not by faith, but as it were, by works. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Israel was never, ever looking for righteousness in the right place. They sought righteousness by law, whereas the Gentiles responded to the offer of righteousness by faith. That was the difference. And of all the privileges that Israel had, now recall back to verses 4 and 5, those eight astonishing privileges the nation had. Of all those privileges, the greatest of the lot was that Christ came from their nation. And of all the stumbling stones, that also proved to be the greatest. They stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written in verse 33, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offence, and whosoever believeth on him, Christ, shall not be ashamed. They didn't accept him. And they didn't just reject him, they actually killed him. And you know, brothers and sisters, you marvel at what the nation has done here. They had such enormous privileges, yet they failed so dramatically. And you've got to wonder perhaps whether they failed in proportion to the blessings they received. I mean, it's a fact, isn't it? Sometimes the advantages we have in life can be the very source of our downfall. Because so often our advantages cost us nothing. And so we never really value them. So think about us. We've got the truth. We live in a comfortable society. No one stops us doing what we're doing. We want for nothing, really. We want for nothing. But what does it really cost us to be Christadelphians? For many of us in this room, we've known nothing else. We were born into Christadelphia. Oh, yes, we made a personal decision for baptism but the fact is that most young people who are brought up in the truth do get baptised. But for the Gentiles in this ecclesia, they had to leave something behind. 
They had no privileges. They were not my people. And they saw the truth like a beacon in a very dark world, didn't they? So if we're going to learn anything from Israel, it must surely be this. Don't take the truth for granted. Count your blessings. Don't expect that just because we're Christadelphians, God will automatically save us. That would be the fatal mistake of the nation of Israel, as if our blood meant something to God. Because every which way I read Romans 9, brothers and sisters, it's very clear to me that the abiding lesson from Israel's history is that to fulfill his purpose, God only ever needed a remnant. 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 Remnant.